I'm Ari Gronich, and this is Create a New Tomorrow Podcast. Welcome back to Create a New Tomorrow with your host, Ari Gronich. I'm here with Doug McGurk, my favorite person to have three hour long conversations with. And, uh, hopefully we will keep it a little bit tighter this time, although uh, last time we did do about a three hour long conversation on everything. Indeed. But uh, in the meantime, so Doug, uh, you have been Tony Robbins' top trainer. You have been, you're an NLP master. You do fire walks and fire eating and glass walks and arrow breaking and any kind of breakthrough kind of thing that you can imagine. You've worked with, uh, I think you, you know, managed and worked with three or four uh, detox centers in Miami area, which is not, you know, an easy place to do detox because it's Miami. You got a lot of people (laughs) who enjoy their, their medication. So, you know, let me, let me have you talk a little bit about who you are, what has made you this amazing breakthrough, the noise, uh, speaking coach, what, what makes you who you are? Well, first of all, thank you so much for the invitation and uh, our always amazing and stimulating conversations. Uh, you are a star indeed. Um, the the long and short of it is, I don't know about you, uh, growing up, I always felt like I was uh, a misfit on the island of misfit toys. Like I, I never felt like I fit in anywhere. And to some extent, I still don't feel like I fit in many places. And now I'm okay with that. Uh, it's I kind of feel like if anything, that is true for everybody that we're all unique and all special and, and have our, our gifts to bring to the world. And growing up, feeling so out of place, I started to go down a path of um, not so great uh, decision making, got into a lot of trouble, started finding uh, drugs and alcohol as a way to manage my state. I was either pissed off or depressed. And it just went between those two. And I constantly felt misunderstood. I got kicked out of every school I ever went to. And um I always felt that I had something to offer. There was always something inside, some connection to something bigger than me that I was just part, as I believe everyone is, we all have that yearning. We all have that light inside us. And I was always on the path. And one night I came home, uh, I was probably 17 years old, hammered. And uh, back then I'll date myself a little bit. Tony Robbins was on infomercials pretty much 24 7 right he was didn't matter you know around the world he was somewhere on that uh, experience and i was always, always always into spirituality i remember i went to a parochial school it's called shamanade on uh, in long island and it's a school a very prestigious school bill o'reilly went there sean hannity like a lot of uh very successful people uh had been to that school and it's Catholic. And uh, I was always in the library looking at the books on a cult and, uh, you know, just like otherness and just kind of going, there's more to this. It's not just this. And so I've always been on the path. And so I come home one night hammered and uh, I see Tony again. And I go to my mom, like, mom, give me your credit card. And she's like, what for? And I was like, the Tony Robbins, uh, personal power. And she's like, wow, we have that, honey. I'm like, we do? It's like, yeah, it's down in the den. Still sealed, never opened, and now I'm really going to date myself, cassettes. I think, so, I think I have that that same set of cassettes. It was a big blue yep. of different cassettes, one after the other. I had two in, like two per, two yeah. per box. It was like 15 little books that had two cassettes. Yep. Mm-hmm. So I started listening to that and it just made sense to me. Like what Tony was sharing made perfect sense. And I could start aligning kind of why I was feeling the way I felt and help me understand people better. And, and I always, I remember one time I, I was, I think I was about 
eight or nine years old and we were out for, I don't know, it was Christmas or Thanksgiving dinner at, uh, I was at the Milleridge Inn on Long Island, uh, a nice, you know, kind of dinner thing. We we're all out kind of fancy dress. And I saw a guy sitting there all by himself eating. And I was like, Oh, this poor guy. He's like eating by himself. He's all alone. I was like, can we invite him over to eat with us? And my parents were like, yeah, go ahead, invite him. So I did. I went over there and I invited him and, and he declined. Uh, but I always had that in me, like that, like care for people. I always loved people and, and have a, a big heart. So that's why I connected, I think, with Tony, uh, you know, after now, obviously working with him and getting to know him. Um, he's a big teddy bear. He's a, a giant hearted, incredibly loving human being. And that's one of the reasons why we connected. So I, I just started applying that stuff, like just personal power to the best of my ability. But of course, I didn't like everyone didn't apply all the exercises, didn't do all of them. I listened to it and thought I'd epiphany my way to, uh, you know, to success. And um, after struggling with a, a bunch of issues and getting arrested and, and all those things, I was like, I got to I got to just turn my life around. And I went on a car ride around the country with a good friend of mine. We drove around the country and camped our way. And I listened to that religiously. Um, that was like all I listened to. And when I came back after that summer, I think it was my 20, I was 21. I was like, that's it. I'm doing music. That's my passion. I'm going to do music. And I, I ended up uh, getting a, an internship at a studio and started applying what Tony taught with modeling and all that stuff. And in the studio went from basically working for free and living off of credit cards to becoming a staff producer and, and making all these big records and working on multiple Grammy winning records. And uh, I really enjoyed helping people make incredible music, but I used NLP and coaching and all these cool strategies to help bring out the best performances of the artists I work with, the bands I worked with, and of course myself. And then um, I, I quit, uh, I applied the Dickens process on myself for, that I just learned on personal power. And in one night I quit uh, smoking crack, doing coke, uh, smoking pot, smoking cigarettes, drinking, like everything in one night. Um, and, uh, and just kind of started to transform my my existence by just immersing myself in whatever environment that I was looking to uh, succeed in and did very well in music. And then the peak of my career is when Napster came out. Uh, so I had to reinvent myself. And but I was speaking in music conferences at that point. I was showing bands how to monetize that they didn't need record companies and really helping out. But I was really I loved doing that. And um I had to reinvent and start over. Uh, and during that time, I ended up um, getting divorced, losing, basically losing everything. I had to start over literally from ground zero. And it was about this time of year when I had to do that. Interestingly enough, um, it was, uh, it was during that now, isn't it? Pardon? It's getting time to reinvent now again. Always. I, I mean, the, the truth is, and what's interesting, even back then, I remember, you know, learning statistics about all that and that, you know, like our parents, they had a career. And that's kind of it. Like they, they usually found their career, they did their time and they got their retirement. And, you know, generally speaking, that was real. I mean, my dad, for the most part, was able to live that existence. And certainly um, while growing up, he was preaching that, you know, you know, you get a job, you get a, you know, all that. And, and that's an interesting also experience where, you know, I was a creative, I wanted to do music and all that. And my dad and everyone in his family are all doctors of some sort. They're all like, my dad's a, a lawyer, but he, it's a doctor of law. Um, so like everyone there is uncles or, you know, dentists, uh, ER surgeons, one guy's a the uh, professor at MIT, like all super educated people. And I'm like, I want to rock. Right. And, and uh, it didn't go over very well. Um, so I had to certainly go against even what was being taught as who I should be or how I should show up. Um, and yes. Yeah, so, so now they had that model of, okay, you get a gig and then it turns into a career and then you get your pension or what have you. And now that even growing up during that, it was already starting to happen where people change careers 
usually potentially a couple times during their lifetime. Um, now, I'm not even sure what a career is anymore. Like it's turning into the gig economy here. Like people are are doing multiple things and they're, you know, they're having, there isn't a box for most people to fit in the way it used to be. Uh, companies are falling apart. You know, it's just, it, it's, people are having to reinvent themselves daily. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> I find that, that to be a fascinating thing that's going on because uh, I think that it's indicative of losing the master apprentice relationships. And there's, you know, no longer somebody who is a master at something like a shoe cobbler, for instance, that's training his kids to become shoe cobblers and showing them, you know, from early age on up how to be exacting and perfecting in what they're doing. And so, you know, that, that to me is, is kind of how that plays out is there's no longer the master apprentice, which means there's no longer that high kind of quality products. Products are not made to last anymore. They're made to be obsolete, you know, planned obsolescence. And people are, people are by their nature, I think, very proud people. And if they're doing something that they know is not going to be of quality, then a lot of times they'll want to try new things and do many different things until they find what it is that their heart kind of makes their heart sing. I don't think that people think of it that way, but that to me is, is kind of where that happens. So, but well, I understand what you're saying. Well, it's where, and I think this is where I think you and I come in and a lot of people in this space, like for the, ultimately Tony was my, you know, master and I, I was the apprentice. Um, and at first it was, you know, a paid thing. I had to pay him for the coaching. I had to buy the, the tapes and then go to the events and, you know, do all of that until it got to the point where I was able to get the type of apprenticeship where I was still getting, you know, paying in sweat equity, getting paid us, you know, a commission for the work that I was, you know, the value I was adding. But yeah, now I think the, the difference becomes we have to seek out mentors and pay for it because it's it, the relationship is different. We're not necessarily building a business that we're taking over. We are ultimately, you know, if we think about it, almost hiring our, com our, our future comp competition. You know, not that I compete with Tony, like it's a different, you know, I, it's apples and oranges in some respects, but you know, anyone in the information marketing space is essentially competing with each other to get someone's attention to add the value so someone can get a taste and go, okay, cool. I, I like the taste of your nutrition where, you know, everybody is essentially, we're all teaching the same stuff at the end of the day. It's really all the same, you know, basically, the, it's the, the, the golden rules, right? Like it's ultimately what we're teaching is how to be better versions of ourselves. And there's not a whole lot of different ways to do it in many respects. We're just going, oh, I like it hot and spicy or I like it mild, but the nutrients are still going to be the same. And the way our body ends up utilizing it has some differences and a lot of it is still the same. We assimilate and eliminate. We, you know, we take information in, we use it, and there's other stuff we go, ah, not for me. Um, and that mindset is is instructive, I think, in today's world. Right. So, so let me co kind of take a step back. You talked about the Dickens technique. So, mm -hmm. what is that? And you know, and and in general, I'm going to have I'm going to ask you a couple questions. So, the Dickens technique, what is it, and how does it work, and how did it work for you? And then the second thing is one of my biggest issues within the self-development world, and I've been in it since I was eight years old and I did EST, okay? Mm -hmm. So I did EST, LifeSpring, Landmark, Forum, uh, iSource. I mean, I, I've done MITT, I've done Tony, I've done, I've, I've done a lot. And mm -hmm. so I see a pattern. And the pattern that I see is that people get really motivated 
and they have this massive amount of conceptual things that are being told to them. And then 95% of them will never ever fulfill on the promise that's been made to them mm -hmm. of being able to transform their lives because it's really mostly conceptual and not in actual action, you know, actionable steps. So how did you become one of those 5% that actualized the techniques? What is the Dickens technique? And what would you say to other influencers? Because I really want to just challenge the shit out of them right now and say, stop what you're doing, reassess who you think you are, <laughs> mm -hmm. and stop teaching the concepts and start teaching actionable steps that people can actualize and do right now so that they can actually, I'm, I'm saying actual a lot, if you yeah. <laughs> actually are yeah. the benefit of what you're teaching. So... Okay, so great questions. So the Dickens process um, is modeled after the Charles Dickens classic, A Christmas Story, and essentially it's working with temporal dynamics. So what the experience is, I know you've experienced it, so for anyone who hasn't, is it's taking a, a current behavior, current state, current belief, current something that is non-resourceful, looking in the past as to how, what impact that has had in your life in the past, what impact is it having currently? So you get your brain to go, oh my gosh, that sucks. That's horrible, right? And then you get feels that the pain to it, right? That's what happened with Charles, with, with uh, Ebenezer Scrooge, right? They brought him to the past and said, look at all this pain this has caused, and then brought it to the present. And look at how this current behavior is causing this pain. And then to the future, if you don't change, this is what will happen. And then your brain basically goes, well, crap, I, it sucked in the past, so I can't go there and like lament. It sucks right now, so I can't even lie to myself right now. And it's going to be even worse in the future. So right now, temporally speaking, it sucks everywhere. So it forces you to make a decision to no longer continue that behavior. And then you create a new vision of possibility and then transmute that into probability by creating such a compelling vision that it starts pulling you towards that, that it becomes part of your identity. It becomes in your nervous system who you are so that you can continue to do the work when you don't necessarily want to, uh, when the time, when things get challenging, right? And I remember when I did the Dickens process with Tony at my first UPW, one of the um, the aha moments I had, excuse me, was, you know, I, I came to this sort of presence to um, the understanding of if we're made in God's image, and, and we hear that in a lot of a lot of different teachings and so forth, it's not just in the Bible, um, that were made in God's image. So then I said, okay, well, that, all right, I, I, let me buy that. Let me go in for that for a minute. Um, okay, so we're made in God's image. Well, if that's true, how dare I play small? I am dishonoring God, my creator, the creator, the, the, the singularity-ness by playing small. So I, I must step up and play bigger, at least bigger than what I'm playing now. And that that has basically been a thread that goes through my life where I apply that in also the idea that I surround myself with people who have bigger lives than me in every respect. Not, I'm not talking about, you know, finances exclusively. I'm just talking about they, they have amazing relationships. They have amazing health. They have amazing certainty and confidence. They're amazingly loving and giving, and they, they just play at a high level, which holds me to a higher standard, right? So I, my, I hang out with people, and this is what I teach, hang out with people whose normal is what I aspire to. So I want my normal to be where they're, like, their norm. I want my, my aspirations are like their normal. So it pulls me up. So that answers that a little bit. Now, when it comes to the um the idea of application here's been my experience well i mean it's a it's a deep question in a lot of ways because there's a lot of factors at this absolutely there's a lot of and, and it's different for a lot of people and my experience and I, and I experienced this in the music industry 
it is not nearly as glamorous as you think it is. Most of my life in the music industry, if I was in the studio making Grammy winning records, it was spent 12, 15, 18 hours. And as a matter of fact, one, and I think it was waiting for tonight. As a matter of fact, I think this was the record. It was waiting for tonight. I was, I worked on that record. We won a Grammy for that. And I remember I was at that time I was, I was salaried for the company, the production company. And I got like something happened with the schedule and I, I came in and, and the, the, the studio manager was a manager was with someone in finance was like, um, I, I, I came in, I asked for a day off or something. And they were like, last week you only worked. And she gave, she threw out some number. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And she's like, well, look, this day you worked from, you know, you only worked five hours. You worked from 12 to 5 PM. And I was like, okay, that's 12 on Thursday to 5 p.m. on Friday. I was here in the studio for 29 hours. I, what are you talking about? Like that was normal for things like that to happen. So it, was, it wasn't very glamorous at all. But then you go to the red carpet and you're like, ooh, wow, that can, everyone sees that, that's what they want. When I was on the road, you, sp you play a show, you play a concert. I mean, we did this once. There was one time we had a gig in Gainesville, Florida. I was living in New York at the time. And the band I was in, we got uh, we got hired by Gainesville College to come down and uh, FAU or whatever it is down there and to play uh, at, the, at the college. Mm -hmm. We drove from New York straight down to Gainesville with a trailer behind us in a van, took a nap for like an hour, played the gig, Took it well. Took a shower, played the gig, took another shower, got back in the van, and drove back up. So for forty-eight hours, we were away. It was like two days, basically, twenty-four hours driving down. Played a gig for a couple hours, got back in the thing, and drove back. Well, for that two hours, it seemed pretty glamorous because, like, oh, we're on stage, we got people cheering, signing autographs, and all that, and then back in the van. And that's where the magic happens. That's where the work is. We just get celebrated for that couple of hours. And same is true. I think it's it's more than just personal development. I think this is basically the average statistic is, you know, what is it like in recovery? It's like 5%. Right. Maybe like there's, it's really difficult to get those actual numbers. But when you look at someone starting a, uh, any business, it's like 5% succeed. Someone doing uh, weight loss, 5% get it right the first time. Someone uh, starts, gets on board with a, a multi-level marketing. 5% of them seem to be able to get it done because the average person is being so inundated, especially now with the idea that it's supposed to be easy, that it's supposed to come, you know, all I got to do is make a vision board and then it's going to, you know, come and, and I'm all for vision boards. You got to have that. And that's like saying, I, all I need is the car, but I don't need the engine. I don't need to fuel it up. I don't need to take care of it. I don't need all of that. And it's like, well, you're missing a large portion of the work. As a matter of fact, 95% of the work is the work that nobody sees, that it is not glamorous. It is sometimes boring or, you know, not as rewarding as we would like it to be. So personal development is a similar thing. And, I, and, and here's what's interesting. It's because every, I believe everyone has a loving heart, even when they don't, they just don't know how to express it. Um, and, and they have love for like, you look at gangs, right? They have no problem going, you know, really violent gangs would go out and kill somebody for the love of the gang and the people within they'll kill people for saving, you know, it, like it's, right. you get what I'm saying, positive intent. Yeah. So when I look at personal development, I go, man, this is an opportunity where people could get all their needs met, right? And, and feel like they're adding tremendous value because, you know, they, they could get famous during the process. They can make all this money during the process. But meanwhile, it's all the other work that no one sees that actually prepares you to be able to do the work. You know, I look at Tony. I remember um, 
uh, wasn't the last time. It was, it was a couple events ago, and uh, Tony had brought in some new content. Tony, the number one guy on the planet when it comes to events, you know, doing it was, uh, you know, he's got up to it, last live event was 14,000 people. And now he's got like, what, 23,000. He's maxed out is you virtual. Um, he added like a 30 to 40 minute section that he was still practicing the night before for like four hours. Like he didn't get any sleep the night before because he was woodshedding and practicing that one piece so that he could do it with the Tony mastery. Tony, as talented as he is, still does the not that pretty work. And I, I think to your your point is that a lot of people spend more time wishing and working in visualizing the success without doing the actual work necessary and oftentimes it's because they don't know what to do i've been there there have been times where i'm like I, I don't know what to do because there's so much information out there that's why it's so important that we hire coaches to go yeah you got the tools you got all that but let me show you how to really apply them this is all you need to focus on do this like we, we need we need mr miyagi you know and at the time we're not going to know why we're waxing on and waxing off and why this is important you know, but at the end of the day, the waxing on, waxing off is the fundamentals that we need to experience before we can go out there and get in the ring. Yeah, you know, it seems like we have a lot of Mr. Miyagi's or at least want to be Mr. Miyagi's going going around these days, but not a lot that actually get the job done like he did with Daniel, right? <laughs> I, I I just watched Cobra Kai on uh, on Netflix, so amazing so oh, so great i can't wait for uh three and four i know it was it was uh it was tremendous to see that that i mean this is 40 years later it's not like a little bit of time has gone by it's 40 years <laughs> but uh you know the the idea that people don't want to do the work i think is a falsity I think that what you just said about them not knowing maybe what to do or how to do it, or even like the starting place for it, um, that would be a little bit more kind of where I would see a Mr. Miyagi, a person that you're accountable to and that isn't necessarily charging you, right? Mr. Miyagi didn't take Daniel as an apprentice and say, you got to pay me. He, you know, he got a lot of work out of the guy, <laughs> but it was more like, I'm a swordsmith. I need somebody to cover my legacy and become a swordsmith just like me so that my legacy can be extended. And that legacy is now being sold, right? With, with uh, the onset of all of these masters of transformation it's being sold, right? And so I'm wondering if it's possible even to have a massive effect on a population when all you're doing is selling the service versus, you know, giving it the way that they used to in the old tribes. And, um, and maybe it's just the work. I know, you know, you've had such an amazing ability as an apprentice to take the information that you're given and transmute it into, I can now be a master at this. And I'm not sure what the difference is between you and somebody else who, you know, the, the 95% that don't do that. Um, I don't know specifically it, it it's it's not it's it's hard it's not a general answer i think each person has some uniqueness and that's why coaching is important right so that's the work i do i have you know some high level fundamentals and then it's digging in a little bit deeper to find okay this is what's going to motivate you this is what's going to light the fire under your ass because different people are motivated by different things so it's uh, as far as getting under the hood on that situation, that's why the it's important to, you know, obviously get to know somebody. So it's not a global answer. And at the same time, 
we run a challenge because I, I I agree with you. Like, but the thing is, we're 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 drowning in a in seas of information. Everybody, uh, you know, in the marketing world, and 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 maybe this is part of it as well. <sighs> We're getting lost in looking for purpose. I think that we're we're losing the idea of small purpose leading to big purpose. Uh, in many respects, from my ex humble experience, you know, I look at you know I've I have my wife and daughter, and and they're the most important people in my world. I, of course, would love to change the world and create world peace and end human suffering in its entirety. And I got to start with my daughter and my wife and me. And that's not as glamorous. And oftentimes we're, and I think now more than ever, we've been conditioned to our value only being represented by how famous we are or how much money we have or the car we drive or the watch we have. And we've become... Um, addicted to a measurement that is um, not sustainable for some, but it's sustainable for others. And there's no judgment. I, I, it doesn't matter. You know, if people love stuff. That's great. We all love stuff. Um, are we becoming a slave to it? Um, and then we look at um, not understanding uh, people enough and we see someone going driving the fancy car and having you know all the money in the world and all of that and we go i want that life and then you see they're miserable because they made that their god and then their family life is miserable or their health is miserable and they're they're not balanced we're also i believe conditioned in the length of time that it takes to succeed so we are looking for that instant gratification. And, and that boils down to even, you know, when I'm training salespeople, sometimes people, you know, the salesperson doesn't even ask a second or third time for the sale. So then because, hey, if it doesn't happen on the first call, then, you know, what's the point? And so we have this, this interesting dynamic of all of these bits of information coming in that, look like it should happen a certain way because that's what's being exposed, right? No one really wants to share, excuse me, what, what a faux pas. Uh, so no one wants to like, uh, so, and, and, and to, to this point, so when I left working with Tony to go to the treatment center, he was like, look, dude, remember this, you are not a speaker, you are not a coach, you're not a trainer, you're not an author, you are a marketer, of your coaching, of your speaking, of your training, of your books, because you could be the best on the planet. If no one knows who you are, you're not going to help a single person. And that's the dance that we're constantly doing is are we marketing or are we serving? And is the service the marketing? And then we get into, well, I got to give all this information away. And then people give all the information away. But then when it's free, they don't apply it. But then we have a great heart and we're like, oh, but you don't have any money. So, I'll, you know, I, I, I just want to help you out. And then it just goes into this interesting conversation and so we're always competing for the next opportunity to add value. And at the same time, when you look at marketing, weight loss. Let's use weight loss as an example. So product A, product B, same product. Product A, take this pill, drink this shake, and the weight falls off. You'll be within two months, you'll have 20 pounds removed. Oh, I want that one. Product B, same product. You gotta, it's gonna be uncomfortable. You're gonna have to change your diet. You're gonna have to exercise, move, breathe, sleep, drink lots of water. It's gonna be uncomfortable. And these products will help a little bit, um, but really the, the it's gonna, just gonna help you if you do all this other work that you don't wanna do. It's gonna be painful, uncomfortable, and it's gonna take time and it's not gonna happen overnight. Who's gonna buy that? No one would, buy, very well, I should say that. Very few people would buy that. You would because they understand it. You understand it, but the average person is gonna go, 
I, I want I want to take the pill and be done with it. I don't want to change my diet. And actually, you'll see ads say that lose 20 pounds without changing a thing, without changing your diet, your exercise and all that. Those go through the roof. So we've been conditioned to think and have an expectation that there is going to be an easy way, right? And people aren't lazy. They're just extraordinarily motivated to work as little as possible. See, you know, it's funny. I, I kind of agree and kind of disagree with, with that statement because I think that people are programmed to work really, really hard with the thing that they're passionate about and be lazy about what they're not necessarily passionate about. And for example, you in a studio for 29 hours and that being a regular thing, that wasn't because you were getting paid enough on salary. For free, I did for a while. You would have done that for free and you would have done it lazy as, uh, you know, not la lazy hasn't been a thing, I don't think, in your life, except for things that you're not passionate about. Well, yes, and we get distracted, right? So things come up and we have, you know, shiny object syndrome. So that's where discipline comes in, where, you know, there's a point at which, you know, wisdom and discipline, uh, in my experience, has been valuable because and doing the things are things that we need to do, you know, and, and or find someone to support us in. Um, like as an example, you know, admin and stuff like that. Not my, and sadly not Heidi's bag either. So the two of us, you know, our passion is doing the work. Our passion is serving, is helping people. So where we need help is in the admin side, in stuff like that. But there are times when we have to do it. Like, it's just, it's, it, we just don't have, you know, we're not, you know, having multiple people doing all of that other stuff. And it, it, there's that balance where then we get sucked into kind of little rabbit holes or things take more time and we go, oh, this sucks because, I have to do these things that I don't want to do because I'm not passionate. So then I put it off or I don't do it and then it backs up. And so it's it's finding that balance. So I, I agree. Um, and it's uh, while I I totally am on board with, you know, finding your passion and and going for it. And sometimes your passion may not be able to pay you. Right. But I I, I believe that if we kind of transform our society a little bit, just, just, just a little bit, then we'll be able to go back to a time with the ability to live our passions, like times of Renaissance, for instance, Leonardo you know, da Vinci and Michelangelo and Thomas Edison, Benjamin Franklin. I mean, these people didn't go to school they didn't graduate anywhere. They didn't become an artist or an inventor or a you know politician. They were in their souls those things, and they simply took their soul, turned it into the passion, and by doing that, made it so that it worked. We've developed our society since then to only value the money that somebody can bring in rather than the contribution that they bring. Yeah. And that's not, that's not a hundred percent, but that's a, a lot of it, right? Is that our world values who brings in the money. Like somebody like Mother Teresa may not be Mother Teresa today, while that's who she was then, right? She may not have had that impact like she had today. Well, yeah, and I agree 100%. And the, the challenge that I believe we're facing now at this point as well is an expectation that if we're not having an impact like a Leonardo, Di, you know, DiCaprio or Da Vinci, uh, if we're, you know, we're not famous. And what happened, I think, with the advent of the internet 
is that everyone had the opportunity to create an image, create a uh, positioning uh, to present themselves as if they are having that level of impact because there's like a level of expectation of that's also part of the value instead of just being okay with being a great mom, being a great dad, being, a, you know, like you, you don't have to be famous. And I know he goes back to Warhol, you know, everybody wants their 15 minutes. Like there's, it, there is that element and the challenge and the blessing with technology today and the internet is that we've leveled the playing field on one level in that everyone can have the opportunity to put it out there. And now we've created a new level of standards by which we're being measured and filters and you know making sure we're taking the picture from the right angle and making sure that we're posting enough and saying enough and then worrying about oh wait you know now we're back to marketing right so are we marketing our business so we want to go all right so we're looking at metrics we're constantly looking at metrics and measuring and, oh did this work did that work well it's the same for the little kid who's going did i get a like did i not get a like i'm measuring here's my metrics that worked that didn't work oh this picture did oh i said this i got some attention right and then we're we're looking at all these other experiences and this is, and then if I back that up a little bit into Tony's six needs, there we are is getting addicted to the significance, getting addicted to the, you know, the, the variety of, oh, you know, let me see who I can meet, who I can connect with. And, you know, like we get addicted to that, but we're not necessarily growing or contributing. However, we have the illusion of growth or contribution, especially contribution, because someone now starts getting on their soapbox and thinks that they are, they, it's their responsibility to point out someone else's foibles and how so-and-so is the wrong, you know, and then now we get into the whole dynamism of, you know, opinion and that it's for your own good that I'm telling you why this is bad or that is bad and why we can't do this or can't do that. And it's such an interesting dynamic that we're living in right now because it's almost like, remember Jurassic Park? Yeah. In that line that uh, Jeff Goldblum, you know, said something like, well, you know, we have the, we have the technology to create these monsters, but we don't have the, the wisdom to decide, you know, to ask whether we should make these monsters. And I'll give you a great example, not to go down a, 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 a pandemic conspiracy theory, you know, thing, but it's a, a great example of it is it seems and it seemed at the time that there was no actual plan in handling the pandemic. All of the secondary and tertiary fallout considerations never seemed to have been addressed while having this, we gotta stop everything and, and all that and make all these drastic changes without having a go, oh, let me think about this. What impact is that going to have long-term? And same is true and it's happened you know, with, with the technology of the internet that not that I don't believe in regulations, I believe in consideration and going, okay, hold on, let's, if we do this, what are the possibility? What are the ramifications? Yeah, I see you guys are gonna make lots of money and you've got to gather all this data and you can, oh, make it so convenient for everybody and all of that. But when we do that, here's the fallout. Here's what's going to be some potential challenges and what fail safes do we have in place here? You know, we all love getting in the airplane and the excitement of jumping out of it. But if we don't have the parachute and we haven't done some due diligence on that, it's going to be a, a really fantastic short ride. And I, I feel like that's kind of one of the things we've experienced lately over and, you know, probably for the last 100 years is not taking into consideration because everything's moving so fast, not taking into consideration and thinking through the outcome possibilities from all perspectives. So I'm going to I'm going to take that and and kind of twist it a little bit into cognitive dissonance. Mm. Right. So lack of cognitive dissonance or lack of common sense, sorry, and yeah. and add in cognitive dissonance and emotional dissonance. And emotional dissonance. We don't even know what we're feeling anymore. Yep. Right? 
So how does that play out in the decisions? Like we're looking at an election season, right? We, we just had an amazing debate between our presidents or our president and, and uh, the person who's seeking office, Mr. Biden. Um, there seems to be a lot of cognitive dissonance and a lack of common sense in every aspect of life. Yeah. And I'm, you know, my, my, my way of looking at things in general is I, I try to find out and understand why people choose to do things the way they choose to do them, why they're um, so okay with making decisions that go completely 180 against their own self-interest. And by self-interest, self-interest is not just an individual, self-interest is a society at large, right? So, you know, I look at things, I'm in the medical world, so I look at things like, why would we allow 70,000 chemicals to be put on our food, air, water, food, air, and water to be introduced into our society? Since only the 1970s, late 1970s, we've had over 70,000 new chemicals arrive. Most of them are being put into our food and our water, mm -hmm. and yet people, don't complain. They don't say that ain't cool. I'm not going to buy that. They're not saying, I mean, they're not really up in arms about anybody. There's like such a small, insignificant amount of people fighting that fight, for instance. Or if a company, let's say, is poisoning the well water in their own community and all the people are getting cancer. The employees are not the ones making those decisions, but why aren't they stopping those decisions? And so that's kind of like, that's the cognitive dissonance. Yeah. Actions don't equal the results. And so let, let's talk a little bit about that because to me that can lead into some solutions if we can get a hold of this and what's going on. So, a couple of things. Obviously, this is such a complex conversation. And I think part of the challenge is, is that it seems that sometimes people are not really all that into having a complex conversation. They want it to be a simple yes or no, do this, do that. The, the, the complexity challenges things. And that, and that's true for everything, right? The, the tyranny of complexity stops people from taking action because they go, oh, I, I don't even know what to do. And then they, they just freeze, right? So when we don't know what to do, we freeze. A confused mind says no. So the complexity, and, and now, you know, we can unpack this into education, right? I mean, I believe that education has failed over the years. I, I, I look at, um, you know, like books from like what school books were for fifth graders in the like early 1900s or the late 1800s. And they are like college level, literally like and they're unpacking like you had to know so much about the government and how it ran and and you i mean it was a huge part of the educational system why because the expectation was you were likely going to serve at some level for some short period of time not be a career politician so let's table that for a second next we move into resignation where people just go, I, this is, I, I don't even know what to do. And they actually create a synesthesia and they close off the consequences. It becomes an addiction, right? So that part of the nucleus accumbens, the NA in our mind actually bypasses. So we consciously know, and there's a cognitive dissonance. We consciously know the negative outcome from said behavior but we still do it because we don't feel the consequences and now we're into the emotional dissonance and the science behind it how that occurs is there's actually a part of our brain that wires itself through conditioning through expectations and through the consumption of said poisons which then create this interweaved experience where it's both cognitive and physiological, which creates the emotional because now it's in our body, we're feeling it, but on like, it's like getting lost in Jersey. 
right? You know, it's like, well, yeah, you can't get there from here, right? I don't know if you ever had that happen where, you know, it's like the hotel's across the street. Yeah, it's going to take about 30 minutes to get there because you can't make a left turn. And in order to get there, you'd have to be able to, in 20 minutes, in five minutes, you'd have to make a left. Instead, you have to do this giant, huge circle. And then you go, ah, F it. Right. And then people get a case of the efforts and we see that in addiction. And actually, you know, one of the things when I was uh, working in the treatment center, what I, I really came to uh, use as one of my and I still is one of my keynotes is creatures of addict. And I just point out that we're addicted. Everyone is addicted to something and we we get addicted and I'll use the example like right now when we talked about the debates and the cognitive dissonance that both sides will accuse the other of. And it's unbelievable to watch because we're like, wow, like, man, I, I'm just going to take this position. If we met in the middle, would we be OK with this conversation? Like if, if we just actually took what was going on and in this conversation, whatever that is, and met in the middle, would you be OK? Because it's so, and, and yeah, for me, the answer is probably not. I think we've we've gone way off course for what's best for you know humanity. Um, but that being said, you'll see people actually having that cognitive dissonance, dissonance going, you know, no, we got to put this roundup. We can't have those weeds. We can't have those weeds. And like, well, I I get it. However, as you're killing those weeds, you are poisoning yourself and killing the flora in your body that is necessary to digest, which is creating all these problems in the first place. So while, yeah, you killed those weeds, you've killed yourself in the process. But because we're so interested in the quick fix, we don't want to pull the weeds. We don't want to take the time to do it. We want the instant fix, spray that with some goo and then solve the problem. Um, and, and that's where I think it's not a question of laziness. It's a question of conditioned to expediency that we've gotten addicted to the rate at which things happen. And the challenge is, is that some things have a much shorter lag time. So there's an expectation that everything should have a similar short lag time. So on a computer, you know, with the new iPhone 12 is coming out now, I don't know how many times faster that's going to be, but two years ago whatever phone that was uh, the eight or whatever it is is like it man is so slow and obsolete that would suck if you had to be dealing with that i have the iphone 7 okay i i, I make it obviously i'm being facetious here but the, that expectation is and you see people going out there and having to have and we get back into now the mindset planned obsolescence so now things are actually created because so that we're forced to get the next fastest whatever. So applications or operating systems or all of that. And, and I'll give you a perfect example of how old planned obsolescence is. In this, this is going back in the 40s. Now, this is so German technology. It was this console called Neve. Neve and this is like what Hitler used to, but, they, but now like in music, like if you had a Neve console, like that, it was the warmest, best sounding stuff because, you know, Hitler had to sound good. So they made some great stuff, right? I, I mean, look, we, we can't throw the baby out of the bathwater. There was some great technology. Engineering is amazing. Yeah, insane. So the consoles made so well. And I remember, um, so we had a con one of these consoles at our studio. And I remember the, um, the, uh, the, ing the tech, cleaning like having to clean everything out and uh he, he goes you know and he goes look what i'm doing here uh, okay what are you doing he goes i right, see this console this was made in 1940 or whatever he goes you, you pull it out and it's got like you know you take off the one sheet of metal and it's got all the, the stuff and the knobs and all that and he's like i'm cleaning out the knobs and all this but he goes look at this on the inside of the uh the uh, the metal of, of the module was cl that cl old cloth electrical tape. And he's like, you know why that's there? And I was like, I don't know, it's to, to prevent the, uh, the, the, you know, the things, the, the metal from touching each other. And he goes, do you see that possibly touching the circuitry? I'm like, well, actually, no. He goes, does this console move? Is there, is it like 
any reason that they, it's like, no, actually, no. He goes, that was put there because the engineers knew that over time, who built it, knew that over time that would start falling apart. The cloth would start just turning into dust and force you to send the modules in for service because they made them so well, they would never need service in the first place if all you did was just do this little bit right here. They had to do this in order to keep the business coming back. So this, like, these are thoughts that people have. So I find interesting is, oh, so you're willing to actually plan and create pain to keep someone coming back. Yet when we come up with a solution like what happened with the, you know, the scandemic here, we have all this stuff going on that no conversation was had. And I know we talked about this, like no one said, well, okay, hold on. If we do that, what impact is that going to have on people who struggle with alcohol and, uh, you know, other substances? How do, what are we doing for them? Oh, we're going to keep the, the, uh, the liquor stores open. So they're covered. Great. Uh, what are we going to do for, um, you know, people who maybe suffer domestic violence and all of that. Uh, well, we're going to actually we're going to set up a system that we're going to demonize police in the first place. So they're not going to want to come support anybody. Now, I'm realizing I'm, 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 I'm going extreme here, but I just want to like kind of, you know, again, cognitive dissonance here. We're like, mm, OK, what are we doing about this? Um, well, all right, what about, you know, uh, eating habits? What are we going to do with that? Well, we're going to close all fresh markets and we're going to make sure that McDonald's, Burger King and every fast food store is able to provide food, but any actual restaurant that act may be able to provide some good food, we're going to make it really hard for them to stay open and uh, only allow them to do takeout, which is going to limit the amount of opportunity. So basically, we've taken all those situations, but when someone said, like, uh, excuse me, what could we do to help those people? You know, could we have a conversation maybe on the news about that? No, crickets. Still crickets, very few conversations are coming up about mental health, about all of that. And everyone, you know, I think Trump was the only person who I heard in politics actually, when it first started, say something about those challenges that were going to be coming up. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's incredible to me, as you know, you know, this is this is the world that I live in for my whole life. And it's incredible to me that nobody's been talking about immunity and building your immune system up in general, not, not getting the virus, but making sure that when you get it, because you're going to get it kind of thing, that you are capable of handling the symptoms or eliminating the symptoms because your immune system is strong and your histamine system is not you know fighting every you know piece of particle in your air water and and food um you know so it is absolutely incredible to me that nobody's talking about it but what's even more incredible and this is something we can talk about is how many major companies have banned communication about immunity about alternatives who have censored, I mean, the censorship that's been happening in the last six to eight months. Mind boggling. Is absolutely mind boggling. And the fact is that that's been happening for years with other subjects that nobody has been home long enough to learn about. <laughs> Well, yeah, and and the, the truth is, is that not only has that information been suppressed and censored and so forth, and no focus on what we could do for our, you know, immunity and uh, immune system and so forth. Everything that was done specifically hurt the immunity immune system. Create more stress prevent the ability to actually go out and, uh, you know, exercise and, and all of that. Now, look, personal responsibility, we all have to do that. But if you're conditioned to a certain way, it makes it a little more challenging to navigate. Yes, but in, in your and my neighborhoods, right, we have beaches near us. No, and that's a go to. People for being on the beach walking alone, 
Like I had a friend seven o'clock in the morning, he had a hundred and something dollar ticket for walking alone on the beach, right? Where is, who is he going to give anything to? Where is he? I mean, it, it's windy there. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no, you know, chance of passing a, a virus or any, but he got a fine for trying to take care of himself. That self-sovereignty thing, you know, is definitely something we can, we can talk about. Self-sovereignty and individual responsibility, yes. But how do you have that individual responsibility when every law that's being made, every you know, piece of legislation on businesses that's being done is regulation this and you can't do that and you can't do this and you can't, you know, it's like, and then all you hear for weight loss is, you know, cause everybody's trying to lose weight. We have this massive obesity issue. We've had solution after solution after solution for obesity, yet it's getting worse and worse cognitive dissonance there, but that self-sovereignty, the self-regulation of information and being able to gather that information is so difficult with Dr. Google and with the censorship happening. How does somebody gain that self-sovereignty when all the information that they have is being fed to them by marketing agencies that only are feeding them what they want them to know? This is an incredible vacuum that we're, we're finding ourselves in. And, and I would suggest everybody go back and read 1984 and start actually questioning what could be happening with these situations and to, you know, and then just follow the money. Right. And go, OK, let's just look at this. Who's benefiting from this? You know, and, and look, I'm I'm a capitalist. I'm all for it. Um, I with the fact that it seems like these big corporations have made record profits during this, yet all of these small businesses are going under someone, you know, needs to be able to question that and go, well, wait a minute, something isn't jiving right now. This doesn't make sense. And the, the challenge is energetically how we've become so polarized makes that conversation all the more difficult because as soon, like I, I, I give you a great example. I, you know, I, I work in multiple worlds, as it were. I came from multiple worlds. So my first career was entertainment and music. So they are all, for the most part, most of them are very left, very liberal, very like, you know, into that, wear a fucking mask and all this. I'm like, okay, cool. Look, that's great. I, I, I love you and I'm, I'm not judging anything. I, I hear you and I understand where you're coming from. And as I've now, you know, over the many years also have a lot of entrepreneur business friends who are very successful and always take the attitude of like, look, I don't care who's president. We always made it work. Like I, I'm, they don't get, they don't get so worked up and they go, okay, but this is what I'm going to do here are my beliefs and, and so forth. And they would just ask questions, like not even go, you know, oh, you know, MAGA, all of that, just be like, let's, let's be pragmatic here. Pragmatism to someone so far on the other side is considered right wing, extreme right wing, which that's where then I shared, like when we meet in the middle, the middle is because my experience has been mostly with pragmatists who are more centrist, like they've got some liberal policies in you know philosophies and they've got conservative and they're usually very fiscally conservative, uh, spiritually centered, and love everybody and appreciate and understand personal responsibility. And they think in terms of how can I empower other people? How can I teach them to fish, not give them fish? So it's a very interesting dynamic and how charged this has become. So I think what has happened, my experience is, and I could be wrong, is that the cognitive dissonance is starting to also be grounded in the need for certainty. That things are so uncertain 
they're looking for someone to solve their answers and they're only looking in one place. So as an example, I remember I was just, you know, a conversation on social media and, and I made some comment about how, um, I, uh, you know, our HOA, I'm still paying my HOA dues, but I wasn't able to use the pool. Right. And yeah. I called the HOA and, and spoke to them and, and they're like, well, yeah, but, uh, you know, what if, you know, there's too many people in there and, you know, there's, you know, there, there, there's stuff on the seat and you're too close to each other and we need something. And I'm like, so let me get this straight. You think we're too stupid to take care of ourselves? It's like, if I go to the beach, I bring my own beach chair. So if I'm uncomfortable with the chairs that are laid out there, I'll just bring my own. Well, you know, and some of you use a bathroom. I said, it's like a hundred yards to my house. If I'm not comfortable in the bathroom, I'll just walk home. Like, so basically you're locking the pool that I'm paying for because of some liability that you're afraid of, that there's no way you could prove that if I did get COVID that I could say I got it at the pool. Like, how, how could I even prove that? And so I made some comments uh, uh, as an example, and I don't remember the context at the time. And I got a bunch of people kind of chiming in like, you know, oh, you world, you know, you know, uh, first class problem and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, and give me a hard time. And, you know, the people are too stupid. And they were saying this is what they were saying. And, oh, you know, at, at my place, you know, we, there are people playing tennis and they all got COVID. They're a bunch of idiots. You know, so we got to shut them down. And I was like, wow, like th this is the state of the world we're in. And understandably, this one particular person who made this comment has a 90 year old mother living at home. So he's scared to death. I get it. And I don't think anyone and here's a challenge. I don't think I, I don't know one person. I, literally, I don't know one person who is like, yeah, screw those old people. Let them die. Like, I don't think anybody was like into that. I think everybody was like, okay, I get it. And it, it, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we let old people die by any stretch. You would do what you'd normally do around flu season, which is be careful. Right. <laughs> You know, I, I don't have a political affiliation because I kind of don't believe in labels, but I'll, I'll give you an example of an experience I've been having. Uh, you know, I, I consider myself to have been the rebel in mm -hmm. life. You know, I grew up, uh, I would wear a kilt to school in high school with a snake on my shoulders and no shoes. And I'd be kicked out of school to go put on shoes. I'm like, you're really going to say, I can't learn because I have no shoes on. Like this is, this didn't make sense. I actually got in trouble one year for printing out. Uh, I think I have uh, like 500 copies of the Encyclopedia Britannica page on St. Patrick's Day talking about his history, who he was. Cause I was like, why are you celebrating this guy? He was basically Hitler, <laughs> just an Irish version of it. And, you know, I'm like, why are you celebrating him? Here's the Encyclopedia Britannica, you know, history of who this man was, because that's who I am. I'm, I, I question authority, so to speak. So I found that most liberals normally are the people who question authority. And most conservatives are the people who go with authority, who go with rules, who go with what the status quo is, who don't want anything to progress. They just want to kind of keep the status quo if it's to their liking. And yet everything in the polls, so to speak, magnetic polls have shifted. And the people who traditionally go up against a system are saying, no, stick with the system, stick with the system, because they're so scared of what's going on. And the conservative, you know, as what you would say, right wing side are those who are saying no masks, don't impinge on my liberty, don't impinge on my freedom, don't impinge on me. And so they're saying, no, no, no. And both are ignoring science, which happens to be somewhere in the middle, right? Because science doesn't have an opinion, it just is what it is. It's a 
it, it, you know, science is, is not opinionated, although scientists may be. And so I look at this world going, so I was talking to somebody about a mat, about masks, who was on the, who's on the liberal side of, of life. And that person was telling me, I can't stand all of my friends who are now going on to Trump's side because Trump said, don't wear masks. And so anybody who doesn't want to wear a mask must be on Trump's side versus those who are wearing masks must be on the other side. Right, so it's always got to be some side out here versus versus coming back to that middle place that that we've talked about a, a bunch, but the facts are somewhere always in the middle between opinions, and most of the time the facts have nothing to do with opinions. For instance, a mask filters to ten microns. The virus is 0.1 microns. That's a fact. There's no disputing that fact with opinion. It's whether disputing whether what we're doing with the mask can actually help with the virus. So if you're looking at a 10 micron filtering mask and you have a 0.1 micron virus, that virus is gonna shoot right past the mask. It just can't get trapped because it's not small enough to, to trap, you know, the holes aren't small enough to trap the virus. Simple, no opinion. Yeah, but what about the droplets? The droplets, see, so here's the thing about droplets, right? If somebody coughs on you and the virus lands on that mask, you can breathe the virus through the mask. Not only that, but it's got a place of concentration that's so moist. hang out there for a while. That if it's moist and it's concentrated, it will grow. So the amount of virus, the amount of droplets are going to be increased, not decreased. Well, and can I also point out that uh, I rarely have people sneezing or coughing on me, if ever. I can't remember the last time something like that happened. Right, because most people, like I was raised with Emily Post and we had to take etiquette classes and lessons. And I have a copy, I think, still of a 1950s Emily Post book, mm -hmm. okay? That was my grandmother's. <laughs> but we were always told, cover your face when you're going to cough and sneeze. I just said that, my mic probably picked it up. Uh, <laughs> this is how we're talking right now. <laughs> Right. This is how we're talking. So you cover your face when you sneeze or cough. This stops a two the droplets from spraying out 15 feet at 150 miles an hour. Whatever they've said, you know, it's been all different numbers, but whatever they've said is that's the reason why we wear the mask. There was a doctor at in like frontline ER in New York City who came on crying onto a live saying, I now, I'm crying because I now have hope. We've been doing this long enough that we know what will give you the virus and what won't based on what we've seen. And you have to be in a room within like three feet from somebody for 15 minutes to a half an hour having a conversation that's expressive, like this one, <laughs> that's expressive in order to have enough concentration of virus that it's going to infect the person. So it's gotta be a duration of time that it can concentrate the virus because your body can withstand small bits of it, which is probably why a lot of people have no symptoms and yet they've had antibodies because a lot of people have gotten those just enough. Yep. quantities of, of virus droplets, right? So this actually helps with herd immunity. And so, he, you know, the, the point of the, the matter is, is what I'm saying is the polarity has happened. This magnetic shift in reality has nothing to do with reality. And what people are saying when they're on one side or the other has nothing to do 
with science or with fact. And so my thing is like, we used to have a huge reverence for science and listening to what scientists would say actually was like popular science was a massively popular magazine that, because, yeah. because, you know, for a kid to take apart something, put it back together, figure out how it works for somebody to figure out the inner workings of these things was important, but it's not happening now. So that's where I, I ask you like, cause you are, are an expert in the field of human, you know, human behavior. So what is it going to take? I, I'm not going to even ask what the problem is, but what is it going to take to get people back to a place where reality can sink in of what science is, opinion stops to matter quite as much and people can get back onto like, okay, now, now, now that we've had all this opinion, let's go back to what really is going to function functionally and work for us. It reminds me of uh, the last words of my late uncle. A truck. Um, I, I think that we're, we're going to uh, sadly have to experience some real, um, real pain that I think in uh, forensically maybe learn from. Uh, I think we're gonna look back at this and different opinions are gonna get formed and people are gonna go, ooh, that was a mistake. Um, I, I wonder if, and I know it's not possible at this stage, but if you recall, for a variety of reasons, but one of the ways we got out of the depression was uh, they stopped printing bad news about what was going on and stopped conditioning people in fear, keeping them stuck in fear. And right now there's so many motivators and the, the news agencies and the big companies that own all the news and all of that are benefiting from the putting on the news. I think the, the challenge of 24 hour news is um, everything's gotta be breaking. Uh, everything's got to be so people get stuck in that mode and to ask people to and, and it's gotten past that because now obviously we know that you know uh it's not the news anymore it's opinion um so it's you know very little bit reporting it's mostly you know the thoughts about what is being right. reported and then now we have people thinking you know that their opinion should matter more than it does so everyone has to go out on you know social media and then share their opinion uh, without fat, and we all do it, and I get it. So it, it goes back to I think the original conversation we had regarding education and critical thinking, and the ability and necessity to question everything and be willing to get uncomfortable with being maybe wrong say oh oops maybe that opinion and it's okay it's okay to change your opinion beliefs are dynamic and what we believed and it was so interesting you know using that example um one of the people friends music friends uh very you know very liberal and asked some really interesting questions about you know you know he he said something like well you know he goes uh what if the uh, you know the state came down and said that uh you can't you can't use your power you have to turn your power off your lights off at six o'clock what if the state said that would you walk around the neighborhood and if you saw someone with their lights on after six would you report them <laughs> and i was like well, like well first of all i need way more context than that to even like go there but i'll tell you right off the rip no and and then it would take me it would take me a really difficult conversation and understanding to under to, to then even try on the possibility of me telling someone else what to do with their power. But like to, to even have that conversation. So I think that we're at, at a spot where we need to be able to all of us collectively shake up our current belief systems. 
uh, really take a hard look at our values um, and the consequences of those filters. Where are we drawing that line? Are we willing to take personal responsibility? And, you know, even to a point like, so as an example, right, everything like we've got, and, and this is, so let, let's just look at how we've evolved so fast in the last, let's say, you know, 100 years. 100 years ago, there were a lot more personal farms. You lived on the farm. You got up and dad took son out and showed him the farm and, and said, here's how we, you know, we take care of the animals. Here's how we, you know, get the oxen, plow the field. And, you know, we do all of that. And then the, the mother would be helping with the gardening. But then, you know, it would take all day to cook a meal and all like there was like just to survive was required a lot of effort and there was no FOMO. There was no exposure to, you know, oh, you know, so-and-so, Sally's got this cool thing to, to this degree that we have now. Could someone have a cooler gun, cooler knife, cool whatever? Yeah, and then you'd find a way, go, oh, how did you make that? And you'd learn how to make that cool knife or modify that gun or, or what have you. And then as time went on, cities started to form. And the idea was, I'm going to have a better life when I move into the city and I don't have to plow to get my vegetables. I can go to the market and buy them. I don't have to, you know, worry about, uh, and as things go on, I don't have to, I have to worry about, you know, creating, a, having a cast iron stove uh, to not only cook, but heat the house. It's also, now I have a little oven and, I, and all out of these conveniences. So what happened is our purpose started to shift. Our purpose no longer was survival. It started to be comfort, convenience, and then started to get into a sense of um, uh, luxury. And luxury lifestyle changed as things happened. And the more, I mean, if we think about it, and it, it drives me nuts, if we think about today, like the how easy in so many respects life is for everybody, but growing up, what kids today are having access to and, and the expectation and what they're being conditioned to, like personal responsibility and, you know, expectations, right? And I'll give you a great example. I don't know if you saw that old video, old videos, five, six years ago, whatever, where a, a kid had basically only seen an iPad. So to change, you know, you know just knew to swipe. Right. Was presented a magazine and had a conniption trying to understand why the picture wasn't moving as he was like trying to like scroll the top of the, the magazine. And the, I think a sense of gratitude and realization how freaking blessed we are. What's available to us and use it wisely and, you know, like if you really care about somebody, sometimes giving them, you know, and we struggle with our daughter. I mean, she's today's her birthday. She's six today. Like, how do you express to a child, you know, we love her. We want her. Obviously, everybody wants their children to have it better than we did. And then we go, oh, but is that the best? Better in what way? Do we want to make it easier for her? Because if we make it too easy, when she goes out in the real world, she's going to be like, what the heck is this crap? Yeah, you know, this is this is a, a, a parent's dilemma at the moment. Um, you know, I have my son is six, almost seven. Next month, he'll be seven. And he's got his iPad. He's got his own YouTube channel that he's just started. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is a, a child with a YouTube channel and when he's doing it, because we're homeschooling him right now, because we didn't want him to be part of the um, craziness of what's going on in the schools. I mean, they have scanners and cameras that literally can track 30 kids temperatures at a time through these cameras. It's, it's, wow. it's a little Orwellian, you know, for me, a little too Orwellian for me, but I have to tell him constantly not to hit that microphone button and speak what he's saying. I have, you know, but to type 
what he's saying and to not use the cheat that get, you know, pulls up the recommended word for him, but to actually learn how to use the keyboard and where the letters are so that he can learn how to type. Now, I learned how to type on a step ladder, right? Ding, 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 ching. That was the kind of typewriters that we learned how that they had in school. There wasn't computers back then. It was maybe the big ones, but not like we, I think at school we had just gotten when I went into sixth grade or seventh grade, the Apple twos, uh -huh. you know, but I mean, I want I want him to learn how to physically type. So he knows where the letters are, even if he'll never ever need to learn how to type for his life in the future. So here's an interesting thing about how technology uh, shows up and how governors for good or for bad. So do you know why the letters are not in order on the on the keyboard? No. Nope. When typewriters were first created, when they put the letters right next to each other and the way they were set up, remember how to doink, 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 they would jam. So they had to put them in a weird way to not only slow down, but basically they were figured out like the way letters were used in, if they kept them in that order, they would be close to each other so many times that they had to break them up and that slowed down your fingers so that they wouldn't jam up as quickly because the fastest someone could type actually created the problem. So they slowed it down by making it harder for someone to actually type at that speed and then you know with the, the the way the letters were spread so it's just interesting how they they were able to take that technology and go oh we actually got a truck it didn't work we weren't able to soften it it literally would not work so we had to modify the way in which we did things so that it was sustainable and that's something that we're not taking into consideration as a rule, you're bringing that up right now. Hey, you know, like I want to, you know, it, here's what's so interesting. A lot of the things we do in school were also Miyagi. It was to learn critical thinking. It wasn't to make it easier. It was specifically to make it harder. So we had the muscle, we had the ability to think, we had the ability to do complex problem solving so that if we could solve this problem, if we could wax on and wax off, if we could paint the fence, we go, oh, that's how that applies here. But we've lost that in many respects out of convenience. And it's been a natural progression, right? It just started out as a natural progression of convenience. Hey, we thought we we're going to get the good life. You know, this is, uh, you know, who, who wants to go out and plow their own fields if I can go to the market and get it themselves? I've got more important things to do. I need to follow my passion. And that's fantastic. The challenge is, is now I think the pendulum has swung so far is we have a level of expectation, a level of convenience, a level of um, a necessity for uh, acknowledgement and stardom and, uh, you know, keeping up with the Joneses. And, you know, even to the point we know this, this is fact that there are lots of, you know, again, this is all influence models. So, we, you know, that's the other thing we got to look at how we're being influenced by everything, how there are coaches, marketers who go and rent the plane on the tarmac so they could take a picture in it outside of it. It's not their plane. It's not their car. It's not their house, but they present it as if they are. So then they go, you too could have all this and you buy their product and follow them and then in, enrich them so that they ultimately have it. And then their argument as well, it was just like a high tech vision board. I just created that environment, but now I have it. I'm like, well, yeah, okay. I guess I see the logic into that, but it was a little dishonest at the outset. Right. Right. Yeah, I think Ty Lopez uh, had had that um, roaming around on video about the house that he was showing not being his and how it was rented. Uh, you know, the the car was a rental. The yeah, <laughs> but he eventually became Ty Lopez, right? He eventually became who he was claiming to be because of that. We used to have that in infomercials. I don't know if you remember, there was this Asian uh, guy in Florida who was doing real estate and he would 
he would do these infomercials on these big yachts and stuff. None of them were his, mm -hmm. um, but he was, he was selling the, selling the dream. You know, I think that, that there are enough people passionate about farming, for instance, that may have even been born in a city that would want to do the farming work. Mm -hmm. Enough farming people that are passionate about math, <laughs> for instance, I'm just, you know, making something up that would want to be a mathematician. I think there's enough passion to go around so that everybody has their thing that they're passionate about and it's all feeding each other's things. If we were able to come back to a tribal, more of a tribal society, even within our cities, but you know, people don't even on my block, I mean, I'm friends with my neighbors, but nobody re really ever talks to anybody in this community. I, uh, so try, uh, de depending on the definition of tribal, I think we're, uh, tribal we're slow because tribal generally is for survival. Right. Well, I'm, I'm just saying tribal meaning a circle community. of people. Community is different than tribe. Well, it's different than tribe, but not tribal living. So tribal living is ancient living. Okay. It means, uh, the people like the Indian nation, right, that get together in a circle, the, the society is built upon master apprentice, the, the kids are taught from the beginning, and how to take care of other, you know, the older kids, how to take care of the younger kids, how to cook, how to feed, how to, I mean, well, but... I, and I think that to go a little existential, I, I where I see the, the biggest thing and, and call it a tribe, community or whatever, um, I, I personally, uh, I've, it's just my, again, humble opinion, feel that, um, you know, the lack of God, the lack of spirit, the lack of genuine spirituality, not pseudo spirituality, not, um, you know, pretending, you know, not, you know, just because I say namaste, and I don't know what it means, or even if I know what it means makes me spiritual. Um, I think that we've lost our spiritual center. And by taking, you know, God out of the conversation and the reality, the existence, the acceptance of something bigger than us, whatever your method is, because um, again, we get back into tribal making your God is better than my God or is real or not, instead of an appreciation of the community around the principles of the golden rules of spirituality, of uh, a, a recognition of a connection bigger than us that supports us in a way that is sustainable and is still ethereal. I think there's reasons why, you know, that we don't see that, right? Just like we don't see air or gravity, but if we were to deny its existence, and say, we're gonna, you know, take no part in it. You know, we, if we denied it and jumped out of a plane, we'd experience it. If we denied it and stopped breathing it, we'd experience it. And I think we've, a lot of people have denied the uh, importance and value of that otherness. Right, so, so to me, tribal doesn't mean anything about spiritual. It means, it, it means how we go about the daily work of teaching our, our community. Agreed. I, 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 they are two different conversations that are, though, still part of the conversation because it becomes the the fundamental and understanding and uh, filters through which said group will run their conversations. Yes, and um, so here here's my philosophy on the spirituality spirituality side of things. I think that everybody has a right to their own belief. I saw a, a billboard sign one time that was a message to atheists. And, and it basically said that uh, to be an atheist is the equivalent of a trillion waves hitting the shore. And all of a sudden, a castle, a sand castle appeared because we are a trillion cells or, or so colliding. And then the perfect form of us is, is created. And so 
that was a message to atheists. And I, and I liked the message because to me, there has to be some kind of planner to have planned what is before me, the beauty that's before me. However, I also love the saying that uh, a friend of mine used to say, which is for me to believe that I know anything about anything, including what I'm saying right now is the height of arrogance. And I'm gonna caveat that with man asks God to explain to him the wonders of the universe. And God says, if I were to explain to you the wonders of an apple seed, it would be more than you could ever fathom. And so to me, spirituality is a seeking, not a destination. Mm -hmm. It's not an, a knowing, but it's a questioning. Agreed. And so to, to some people, God is a knowing. I know it, I know it, I know it. And anybody who is against what I know to be real is not going to go to heaven, is not going, you know, it's not going yeah, to not, be... Not in dispute. Absolutely. I, I The kind of caveat I would say to, to that question. Yes, I believe that there is something much more powerful than me <laughs> in this world. Right. And it could just be the man next door or woman who's stronger, bigger, taller, faster, smarter, whatever, or a planning body <laughs> in the sky, whatever, whatever your definition is. But I don't believe that I could ever have an understanding that is accurate. It's only a belief that could be a possibility. It's Right, one hundred percent. I think that if we stuck to the to the to the adventure of finding out and stop with the knowing I know and you don't know what I know because you're in a different sect of a religion, that would solve a lot of issues as well. Because I've seen fights between Catholics and Christians. And I'm like, your belief, your beliefs are almost identical. Palestinian and, and Jewish, your beliefs are almost identical. Well, we're, and I, we're family, we exist together. Let's all freaking find out where we have similarities and where we have questions, and then just ask the questions. Exactly. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree 100%. I, I was raised Catholic, um, and I appreciate the uh, the purpose behind it and what the, you know, the desired outcome is. And, and that's great. You know, we can uh, differ on process. And that's okay, too. Um, you know, the, that is where I think, obviously, I think this country was founded on originally was so that we could practice whatever our process was, but we agreed on the purpose. We've lost a little bit of that, it seems. Um, and it's interesting, you know, I, I, I look at it like, just like you, you just shared, like God, the universe, mother nature, whatever language we choose to put on that otherness, is so like think of it as like a like a supercomputer like a computer that is beyond even anything that we could even comprehend to begin with and you and i we're like commodore 64s we just can't even run the program it's it, it's like trying to run you know the ios on a calculator it just it, it can't be done but we know that it's there and that's where the cognitive dissonance, I think, with all of this occurs because we're all looking for certainty in an answer. And once we find something that we can resonate with and we get convicted to that and resolved to that, then we say everything else is wrong. And we're seeing that in politics. We're seeing that in health. We're seeing that in, we saw that, you know, in, in the treatment world, you know, people are like, no, it's gotta be AA. You know, that's the only way to do it. And I'm like, well, yeah, but this person right here has done it through yoga and healthy eating and exercise. They're getting the same result. You, you wanna be sober, they wanna be sober. Their process is yoga, healthy eating and exercise. 
Yours is going to meetings and doing it that way. We're not here to tell you what the right or wrong way is, provided we've agreed on an outcome. And I think that's where we're having the challenge in in general with people is that we're unable at times to take a step back and go, well, what do you want? And then go, oh, okay, well, yeah, I want that too. Okay, good, let's start there. Let's just stop the conversation. Take a, take a step back and breathe in. We both want the same thing. Got it. Now, we could start chipping away at the how we get there. And let's start by not making someone wrong for their decision on how they think it's going to get there. Now, we could have a conversation and point out the potential challenges with that process. And that would be instructive and valuable because, I mean, I don't think, you know, again, I, this is probably Pollyannic to some extent to any conspiracy theorist. But, you know, if we go down a pathway of, of that, you know, we don't have, you know, the Illuminati and some other things working at, at play to, you know, create the Great Reset and, you know, enslave all people on the Georgia Stones and 500,000 people on the planet and go down that pathway that if we actually just go, you know what? What if the people in charge of making some decisions genuinely wanted people to be healthy and do well and all of that, and that they freaked out and they didn't know what to do, so they made a decision quickly about what to do, and now they're going, ooh, maybe that was a little rash, maybe that was a little harsh, that that's okay and not make someone wrong and go, okay, oh, oh, oops, oops. Like we can't undo it, we, we can't. But to continue down this pathway is just because, because you don't wanna say oops and you don't wanna go, ah, maybe that was a, eh, the embarrassment. And, and that's what I think has happened is that people have gotten, they've doubled down so much on whatever their position is that there's a fear that if you change your mind, someone is going to go, oh, and, and we've seen it. And, and look, this isn't a political conversation, but here's what I do know, my experience. I know, I know a lot of people, and you shared it earlier, who were like, you know what? I, I, I was liberal, I was you know Democrat, I was Obama, I was Clinton, I was all that, and I did not want Trump. I, you know, like I thought he was, you know, the, the devil incarnate and you know, he's just a lighter shade of red of the devil. But now it's orange. Yeah. Yeah, but now I I like I don't necessarily like him and I don't understand him sometimes, but like I, I believe he's doing the right thing and I'm I'm going I, I I'm I'm going that direction. Right. I don't know anybody who was on Trump's side who went, you know what? The other choice is better. I know no one who's done that. I do. And I'm not saying they don't exist. I, I just, do. I do. You do. Great. I know a lot of people who have done people who have shifted to uh, to Trump or to that side of thinking where they've eased up on doubling down on some philosophies and they go, you know what, I think this is going to be better for us if we continue to maintain an idea of freedom and that actually I, you know, the, some of the other mindsets have been more, and like you shared earlier, how it swung have been more draconian and, you know, dictatorial as it were, than, than what was, you know, everyone thought Trump was going to be. Um, so again, not picking sides here. It's just an interesting observation where you go, okay, well, you know, the fact that you've experienced the, the, someone go to the other side is, you know, has not been mine. And of course, I'm not suggesting that it doesn't exist. Right. No, you know, the, the, the thing is I I've, I've witnessed both sides and, um, and frankly, I don't care cause I don't like either of them. I think that both parties, both, uh, systems, I think that what we've got going on, right? What we got here is a failure to communicate. You know, well, that's why I, term limits. We just got to get that right. Yeah, get everyone out in four years. Get in some new blood. People who actually suffer the consequences of the decisions that are being made because they go, oh, when I leave here, I'm going to have to actually live by these rules and not create a double standard as it is anyway. Right. It would be beneficial. And it would be really nice if we started getting 
you know, some of the people I've talked to, some of the people you've talked to, to actually run for office. Because, you know, the, the fact of the matter is, is that what we have is because of the decisions that we've made for 50 years, right? It's not, it's not any small thing. What we have going on right now is because of 50 years of decision-making that has absolutely been horrid. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, you could go to the school system, you could go to whatever, but poli sci, political science, all you know, those things were, were things that we learned, humanities, you know, social sciences, those are things that we learned in elementary school on up. And they don't teach them that much, and especially not to the degree that we learned them. But we need a new flock of people who are talking about solutions. And I'd love to, to actually do this again. I know we've had a few conversations already that have lasted a long time. This is almost, you know, two hour <laughs> conversation and I, I, I'm enjoying it, but I do have to end it soon. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to see us do, we've talked a lot about the issues, right? That we see and somewhat of the solutions but what I'd like to have us do sometime, and maybe we do it, do it as a panel discussion, we get together and, and just have like a panel discussion, but I'd like to see us do a solution conversation. I don't think solution conversations are being done anymore, or at least not very effectively or very well, but a solution conversation where we just take, say, the healthcare system and we go, okay, what would solve you know, heart disease, what would solve diabetes? What would, what would be the thing that solves these kinds of illnesses? And it may extrapolate out into farming and agriculture and stuff like that, but just have- Because cause if you think about all of this, it's all a parasympathetic system. So, you know, one piece is directly impacted or indirectly impacted on a, a, a rather intense level. And that's the challenge that we've basically created is we've got a rat's nest of issues that are directly correlated and causative to what happens next. And that's where, you know, I think that it's a challenge because when people get stuck on one issue, which obviously it's important to them and all of that, it, it's very difficult to really have an in-depth conversation because we've also gotten to the point where we're all, you know, I think it's back to education, is we, we become a, a news bite um, society. So, you know, we go, you know, clean energy. I'm like, all for it, I got it. How do we do that in a way that takes into consideration all of the other structures that are in place. I'm not saying, and no one, I don't think anybody's against solar power. I have solar, I have solar power, but you know, we use, use the example of like, you know, electric cars and they go, well, you know, there are studies that show to make the electric car causes more carbon, you know, challenges that, you know, and I'm not saying it's true or not, but that conversation comes up and it is a real one. Right. And, and the thing with that is, is that it's the decisions that we make. Right. So if we mine something in Canada, ship it, that, ship the raw material to China and then have China send it back to us made because it's cheap labor. We didn't take into consideration the gas, the fuel, the, the, the things that it took to get us there. And what we could have done is just create the manufacturing plant right next to the, to right. the mine. For, for instance, that's one possibility right. of a solution, right? So we definitely need to consider our conversations because, you know, here's the thing. I, I had a conversation once with a trucker and I'll, I'll end with, with this and then we'll go to, to how people can get a hold of you. But I had a conversation with a guy who was a trucker in England once. And he told me a story of picking up a set of eggs. So a truck full of eggs in England, right? He drove them to France, pulled into the back. They unloaded the eggs. He waited for a couple hours. They reloaded the eggs. They all said French eggs on them. They had a French, French egg label, right? So they had basically just been repacked and relabeled. Then he took those same eggs 
to Italy, to the Vatican. <laughs> and he dropped him off. Now, mind you, this there was like two other stops in between where they did the same thing, like Spain, they did Spanish eggs. And then they did the same eggs, same exact English eggs. And then finally they went to the Vatican. He pulled them in. They got labeled as Vatican eggs, okay? And then he took them back to England as Vatican eggs. <laughs> and they, you know, it's like, did they not see what just happened here? <laughs> like, does this make sense? Idaho potatoes, same thing. I had a trucker friend here. He took potatoes from Florida to Idaho and brought Idaho potatoes back here. It's like, we're not thinking. The, the cognitive dissonance is so grand. Well, and there's also there. So then back to follow the money. Yeah. So the, the odds are that in all those situations, the people making the decisions were getting healthily compensated. And then that's where, you know, the, the challenge comes in is like, there are a lot of people with vested interest in stupidity because the short-term gain for them is there, you know, there's that person putting Roundup on their own, you know, in, in their own garden. Right. But my point is that the person with vested interest is not the person who's being affected by this. Right. People being affected by this. And so... Well, they are because it's hurting the economy long term. Right. But what I'm saying is, where is the up, where's the rage, the, the up, up, um, uproar from the people who have to pay for this person's short term gain? Mm -hmm. Bezos, just in the time of Amazon, uh, of uh, the coronavirus, right? Just in the shutdown period of time. If he were to give every single one of his employees, I think it was somewhere close to $110,000, each employee, he has a lot of employees. If he gave them all $110,000, he would be back just to where he was pre-virus. Okay? So where's the outrage that was the word i was looking for where's the outrage at what's happening and who's profiting from other people's misery the people who are miserable are not outraged they're not outraged they're not doing anything to stop and and we'll end on this note because I, I, yeah, so then on this, so I, I don't remember, I think it was, I don't think it was Hitler, but it was Stalin or someone like that. He had this chicken that he was like ripping apart. Uh oh, you're frozen. Um, share the story. He was ripping it apart, killing, like beating it and all of that, but he would continue to feed it. And that abused chicken kept following him for the food, even though he would kick the crap out of it. He'd pull out the feathers and he was just pointing out, he's like, you give someone some comfort, some food, and you can do anything you want to them. And I think that is what we've been so satiated with. Uh, and now go back to diet with sugar, with alcohol, with other poisons that we are just fat and comfy. And the alternative is going to be painful. It's going to be uncomfortable. It's going to, we're going to piss people off. People, you know, it, it's actually studies have shown that people who are more, you know, pragmatist, more conservative, like 80% of them are afraid to say something about how they feel about something because of all the blowback that they get. So it is not a popular way to be is, is a critical thinker. But if we get taken care of, people are like, okay, stimulus check, okay, free phone, okay. Right. So we're, we're going to end on that note um, because we could go on for another hour and we probably will. Let's do this again. And let's have a solution conversation, a conversation that's just designed to create the solutions. But uh, in the meantime, Doug, where can people get a hold of you? And how could they, uh, you know, you, you've got this urockspeaking.com going on. And I know you're about to do a speaker training yep. for some amazing, uh, you know, lessons for people to get to know their voice. So let's talk, let's just, you know, 
All right. So in a nutshell, uh, I believe that our our story, our voice, that everyone is here to share, uh, be a beaming light of possibility by sharing who they are, what they've been through, and light the way for others who have been in similar situations. Um, what I found was uh, this virtual experience is not going anywhere. Uh, we're going to be hybrid. You know, I think this moving forward, we'll still do live events, but a lot of the follow up, a lot of coaching, all of that is going to stay in this world. And, and that's great. You know, it's very powerful and we could have a, a grand reach. And there's a lot of things that are involved in integrating live doing this virtually and so forth. So the, the UROC speaking is to help people master their message gain clarity on who they serve, how they serve them, get their stories kind of together, start crafting their stories and be able to share them both virtually and online. So that's, you know, one thing that I have going. And then my Freedom Hack program is part of that. But my Freedom Hack, we when it's lot when we have it available live, we do our live multi-day event where it's really creating emotional, spiritual and ultimately financial freedom so that we can prove what's possible in the world and lead by example. And you're going to be doing some breakthroughs, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to do my best. The virtual ones are, are tough. I guess I could send a board and, and so forth like Tony does. Um, but the goal is, is anyone who's part of that will get uh, a an opportunity when we go live to be to participate and uh, certainly, you know, make it worth their while. Uh, yeah, I still I'm doing breakthroughs right now, you know, in Florida bless us we're you know we're doing really good so i've been going into organizations and doing team building and doing that so i we're starting to consider uh you know do we do a, a live event for the you know for public um you know it's one thing when an organization they already are working together they already know who's sick or not and it's a very safe environment when we bring in a bunch of strangers they may not be as comfortable, um, but we've been out networking and, and you know, out there hustling. So urockspeaking.com. I also have a uh, anxiety busting guided meditation at guidedhypnotic.com. And it's a free download where you get a, like a 25 minute anxiety buster. And um, yeah, find me on YouTube, Revolutionary Growth uh, TV or uh, Facebook, Doug McGurk, LinkedIn, Doug McGurk, D-U-G. Awesome. Uh, last but not least, two or three actionable steps that somebody can take tomorrow, today, to create their new tomorrow. Breathe. Actually breathe. Take the time, go outside and do some nice deep breathing. Because when we're under stress, which most people are, we breathe a lot less. And then that is, and I know it sounds simple, but when we go out there and actually get present, breathe and, and go out there barefoot on your grass, get grounded, just take the time to start being grateful, start looking for how we are alike rather than how we are different. So catch yourself, just notice, and then get clear on, what it is you want to experience? How do you want to feel? I think we've gotten so addicted to and conditioned to certain emotions right now that perhaps if we started looking at, hey, you know what I want to experience? More joy. I want to experience more love. I want to experience more humor. Start getting present to that and your RAS will start activating for you and you'll start finding things to be grateful for. You start finding things to bring you joy or happiness. But man, the first thing is breathe because without, I mean, I don't know anyone who could do this that can you know live without it. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you so much for being here. This has been another episode of Create a New Tomorrow. I'm your host, Ari Gronich, and thank you so much. Ask some questions, send us, a response, engage in our uh, podcast and, uh, and, you know, take a look at the book, A New Tomorrow. It's got actionable steps that you can do while reading the book to change your life, live your passion and be a better human being for the world that's coming up, uh, creating a new tomorrow. So thank you so much. And I look forward to the next time with you, Doug, and the next time with you audience. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this podcast. I appreciate all you do to create a new tomorrow for yourself and those around you. 
If you'd like to take this information further and are interested in joining a community of like-minded people who are all passionate about activating their vision for a better world, go to the website, createanewtomorrow.com and find out how you can be part of making a bigger difference. I have a gift for you just for checking it out and look forward to seeing you take the leap and joining our private paid mastermind community. Until then, see you on the next episode.